nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, in this first section, we're going to take a look at this Rapture Toolkit. And to help you understand why, why we're bothering, let me take you on a little trip back through time. Uh, the year is 1985. Uh, back to the Future was just out in the box office. Don Henley was singing The Boys of Summer. And the uh, Super Bowl uh, was going on. It was the 49ers versus Miami back in the day. I'm sure you all remember, right? How, how many of you were born then? All right. Hooray. Uh, so Tetris was really big. This is what video games looked like back in the day. A little bit of a history lesson. Um, and I was working on a program at Purdue at the time, um, which was called uh, SQL 2.1, Semiconductor Electrostatics with Quantum Analysis. That was my program. And it was written in Fortran, Fortran 77. Uh, it was supposed to simulate a resonant tunneling diode, which is actually a, what it is is a sandwich of material layers, really, really thin nanometer size material layers. And it turns out if you make a, a sandwich of different materials like that and apply a bias to it, it does really funny things because there's quantum physics involved. And if you get the quantum physics right, you get some interesting characteristics out of this thing. So here's this program that I had. Um, it was written in Fortran 77. Look at all the ASCII art, nicely formatted output. I spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, again, back in the day, that was what we called graphics. Um, and these are the guys in the machine room. Not really, but pretty close back in the day. Uh, and it turns out if you wanted to get a copy of that program, you could write to my advisor. You could send him a letter along with like a $10 bill, and he would send you a magnetic tape, probably bled off by those guys, uh, that had the software on it. So when I graduated, that's what happened. They gave me a cap and gown and said congratulations, and we set up this agreement that anybody that wanted the software could send in a $10 bill and get a tape. That was back in the day, right? So nowadays, the same program is available on NanoHub, and this is what it looks like. Uh, same thing. The only thing that we did was we put a graphical user interface on top of it. So it runs the same engine, the same code, but instead of looking like that, it's like this. And instead of a $10 bill, you just log on to NanoHub and push the button, and it comes up and starts running. And it's pretty easy to use. You just fill in the number fields and then click simulate, and boom, you've got a resonant tunneling diode at your fingertips. So it turns out, back in the day, nobody ever did this. You know, I graduated thinking that I was going to make a million dollars. I'd be the next Bill Gates because everybody wants my resonant tunneling diode program. And all I'd have to do is sell 100,000 copies, right? And I'd be rich. Uh, but uh, nobody did this because nobody wanted to go through the bother of $10 and uh, uh, the magnetic tape. But on the other hand, this now on NanoHub has thousands of users. People are using the code because it's free and it's easy and it's available. So that's the point for all of you. You guys can do the same thing. You can take your code or your advisor's code, you can put a graphical interface online, put it out on NanoHub, and thousands of people will find it and use it. In fact, if you look at the stats, you can see that. NanoHub does a really great job of tracking stats, um, statistics, like how many people have accessed this, how many questions are out there, how many citations in academic literature. I hardly ever got citations when I was doing this, but now it's actually starting to get some citations because it's out there and people find it. So the bottom line, the story, the moral of this story, I guess, is the magnetic tape was $10 and the live simulation tool is priceless. It's like the MasterCard commercial. So, uh, so that's what we're trying to do here. For the next three days, I want to show you guys how to do this, how to take your advisor's stinky MATLAB code and make it look fantastically beautiful and live on NanoHub. Don't tell them I said it was stinky. Um, all right, so here's what it is. The Rapture Toolkit takes that code and moves it into a graphical interface, sits in between the two, and basically manages all of the inputs and the outputs to your, to your program. Rapture stands for the Rapid Application Infrastructure, uh, came out a long time ago in 2005, and we've been sort of working on it a little at a time ever since. Um, it's available as open source on rapture.org. Uh, it has to, you have to spell it with the two P's. You know, it's kind of an internet thing. Um, so the two P's makes it cool. 
and uh, it uh, basically creates standard desktop apps. The best thing about it is that it works with your favorite programming language. So all kinds of languages. You may say, well, I don't like Fortran. I don't know Fortran. Well, that's fine. Uh, maybe you know Java or Ruby or Python or Perl or any of those, MATLAB. So um, we've even added R and a few others recently. So, so whatever programming language you like to use, you can take that code and you can put a Rapture interface on it. And it'll work pretty much the same way. And so far, we've used it to deploy hundreds of tools on NanoHub and on other hubs. So NanoHub has about 230, 40 tools right now. Almost all of them are written in Rapture, just because, not because we require it. You don't have to use Rapture to put tools on, on NanoHub. A lot, some people use other things. But it turns out it's a whole lot easier to build the tools in Rapture than it is to roll your own interface with Qt or MATLAB. It's a lot less work, so people like it. And it's used for other hubs, too. Pharma Hub has about a dozen tools. Nice has a couple of tools. Um, you look at all the different hubs, there's a few, at least a few on, on a lot of the hubs written in Rapture. So there are really three parts to the Rapture. And we're going to start today, this morning, with the builder. But let me walk you through all the parts. By the time we get to Thursday, we'll get all the way here to the tester. So you start with the Rapture builder. And you can kind of drag and drop controls and fill in information and push a button. And it generates, it saves the information into a file that we call tool.xml. It's an XML description. Uh, you know, XML is the extensible markup language. It's like HTML. Um, so it's just an information description of everything you told it when you were dragging and dropping your interface. So we, we save this description. Everything we need to know about your tool is in the tool.xml. Then when you want to run the tool, Rapture when you say rapture or rapture-run, it will read the tool.xml that was generated by the builder, and it will generate the interface based on the description. So if you told rapture, I've got a number, and I've got a Boolean control, and a curve comes out, then the rapture runtime reads that tool description and renders the graphical interface. And when you push the button to run your tool, it'll write out a run file. The run file will have all the information about the inputs and the outputs and everything you need to know about that run. And then finally, the last part is a tester. The tester takes the description of your tool and a bunch of test cases that you've written in the past. So you can, you can get your tool working perfectly, and you can generate a bunch of test cases and set them aside. And then let's say your advisor comes back and says, oh, I want you to add this. I want you to change that. I want you to fix this, change this, fix this bug. So then you go to publish again. You want to make sure everything's correct. At that point, you can run the tester, and the regression tester will run through all of the previous test cases you've generated and make sure everything matches up. If there's a problem all of a sudden, if you fixed a bug but actually broke something else in the process, it, the tester will catch that. It'll tell you something's wrong, and then you can go back, take another look, and fix it. So those are the three parts to Rapture. The builder to build your tool. The runner, this is where when the tool's running on NanoHub, it's mostly running in this area. And then the tester, whenever you go to put out a new version of the tool, you can test it and then deploy it. And you know, these tools aren't once and done. I mean, you may put up a first version of your tool and add some stuff and put up a second version, 1.1, 1.2, 1.5, 1.5.7.1. It's, you can have a lot of fun with numbers. But anyway, you put up a lot of different versions of your tool as you keep adding features. And uh, that's typically a healthy thing to do. But along the way, you want to you test and make sure it's working. All right, so let me show you what the Rapture Builder looks like. When you bring this up, which you guys will be doing in just a minute, um, you get a graphical kind of interface like this. Over here on the uh, left here, um, are, there are a bunch of different control types, so things that you can choose from, uh, curves and Boolean values and uh, strings. And what you do is grab one of those and drag them over Drag them into the input section, and it becomes an input. Drag it to the output section, it's an output. So you drag these little objects around, and you build up the inputs and the outputs for your tool. Then for each one, you highlight a particular one, like this Boolean value that's highlighted in the bluish purple color. And it'll show you all its properties. So you fill in the properties. You change its label, its description, give it a default value. You keep doing that for all the different controls to configure them. And then you can click on that Preview tab. And the Preview tab will show you what your interface is going to look like. And you can check it. If it doesn't look right, you can go back. And you can edit some more. 
look at it again, preview it again. And then finally, there's a save button up at the top. You click on that and you can save out your tool.xml file. And that's, that's it, that's the builder. If you've done that much, you built something, hooray. So, what I wanna do next is kinda of walk you through that, show you what it looks like in real life, not just PowerPoint, um, because you guys will be doing it in just a minute. So, uh, um, you know, you might you, you watch, watch and learn. Um, this is what I'm gonna build. I want a simple tool, it's like a hello world application. So it's got two inputs. One input is who I'm gonna say hello to. I can put in any name there, Fred or whatever. Another one is a Boolean control, which is um, you know whether or not I want enthusiasm. Add an exclamation point to the output. So I have two inputs coming into my tool, and then it's gonna generate some output. And the output it's gonna generate is just a string, the hello world message, right? So that's my very simple tool that I'll build. And I'm gonna build it with two different languages just to kind of show you how it works. I'll build it in Python and I'll build it in Fortran. All right, so let me flip, bring up my web browser. I'm gonna work on Hub Zero. And when you're doing this work and you log into a hub, one of the tools that you'll find, either on the all tools list or somewhere, maybe it's on your recent tools, one of the things you'll see is something called a workspace. A workspace is like a Linux desktop that you can access through the, the hub anytime, anywhere, and it's where we'll do, be, be doing most of our work um, today inside of a workspace. So you find this workspace tool, and there's a little button right here that you can click on to launch it. Um, if I click here on workspace, it'll just take me to the description of the workspace, which I can also click here to launch it. Um, so either way, I can click on, you can click on the big black button to launch the workspace, or you can click on this little launch button. And what it does, oops, is you may have to uh, allow Java to do its thing. It launches a workspace section back on Hub Zero, and mine didn't go so well. It says something about inactive plugin right here, so I'm gonna try it again. Okay. Oh, restart my browser after enabling. Ah, great. Hold on. Hooray, all right. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Let me bump up my font size so you guys can see what I'm doing. All right, so this is what it looks like when your workspace comes up, and if you have any problems with Java, you gotta maybe fuss with it, make sure Java is enabled, because if Java is disabled, you'll have all the problems I just did. So, uh, so now I'm in a workspace, and I have a command line here where I can type stuff. Um, you can see I have a bunch of files here. These are all on, my, on the Hub Zero side. Uh, and I'm gonna go into my bootcamp 2012, into the lectures, and I'm gonna make a directory um, called hello for hello world. Okay, so now I'm in my directory. I can say rapture-builder, and it'll bring up the builder program. All right, so this is what you guys are gonna do. You're gonna rapture-builder, and you get this screen. You can browse through all the objects on the side and see what's there. 
And I'm going to start by grabbing a string and dragging it over to the input and dropping it. So now I have a string there, right? And I also wanted a Boolean value. And I'm going to drag that in. So now I have those two values, and I can kind of configure them. This name right here is the name we'll use inside our program. We'll see that in a minute. Rather than call it value one, that's what Rapture calls it by default, I'm going to give that a, a little better name. Um, I'm going to call that name. That's the name of the person. And I'll label it on the GUI, say hello to. So that's who I'm going to say hello to. A description, you can say this is who we say hello to. And there's some other stuff that we'll talk about later. Um, and I can put in a default value, like world. So by default, I've got the string control now. It's, it's labeled say hello to, and the default value is world, right? Hello world. Now I'm going to look at the Boolean value the same way. And this one I'm going to call in my program, I'll call it exclaim. So that's the name it'll have. I don't want to just call it Boolean. I'll call it uh, enthusiasm. And the, ex the description is add an exclamation point. And down in the default value, uh, I'll set it to false. So you have to ask for enthusiasm to turn it on. Now, one other thing, I want to produce some output. So I can grab a string control and drop it over here on the output side. And the output, I'll give it the name result. And uh, hello output. And this is the output generated by hello world. All right. So now I've got an interface. I've got two inputs, the string and the Boolean value, and it's going to produce a string called result as the output. So I pretty much described my interface. And I want to take a look at it so I can click on preview. And when I click on preview, it tells me, uh-oh, there's a couple of things wrong. There are three warnings for the current tool definition. Do you want to take a look at them? Yeah. All right. Let's take a look and see what I've messed up. Say yes, and it'll show you up here each warning. It says, first of all, I should have a title that describes the tool. Oh yeah, I forgot completely. I didn't even look at the tool part when I was explaining all this to you. So let's make up a title. This is, um, uh, I'll call this uh, simple All right, simple hello world app. And then I click next, and it gives me a description. Uh, OK, it says you should have a brief description of the tool. This usually pops up when you're first doing it. Um, so the description is demo app for boot camp 2012. OK, and then next. And then it says, oh, you've got to set the program type down here. So if you click, and you notice it's highlighted, you click on that, it'll show you these are all the different languages that Rapture supports. And depending on how I want to do the demo, I can pick any one of these. So for right now, I'm going to start off with Python. Any of you guys know Python? Seen Python before? Yeah, all right. Well, it'll make sense to a few of you, I guess. Uh, so let's see what it looks like. And there's no more warnings, so I'm all done here now. So I can click on Preview again. And now it shows me the preview. So I get a sense of this is what the program's going to look like in a minute when I start to run it. And you can very quickly take a look and see, does everything look right? Did I forget to label something? Did it have a good description? You notice all the descriptions that I gave um, will show up as, as tooltips. So if I mouse over, you know, say hello to world, and then the little pop-up message is, this is who we say hello to, right? And similarly, the, the Boolean value, add an exclamation point. So if I flip back, you can see again, if I want to change um, the message, then I can just change any of these inputs, or the default value, and so forth. All right, so all that looks good to me. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and save this. So I'll click Save As and choose. Um, and I can choose to save it to any file. You notice by default it says tool.xml. That's kind of the Rapture convention, is that we always save it into a file called tool.xml. You can change it if you want to, but I'll just keep that. And I can also have it generate a program for me. 
a skeleton program that I'm going to fill in with the logic from my program. And that's a good thing. It's probably a good way to get started, especially if you're just getting started with Rapture. So I'll choose this main.py, or I can, I can give it a different name, too. If I click Choose, I can change whatever name I want, main.py or whatever. That's fine. I'll leave it alone. And then I'll say Save. And then I can quit the program. OK, now if I look around, you notice that my builder generated two files. It generated main.py and tool.xml. Let's start quickly with the tool.xml, just curiously, to see what's in it. And you can see it's an XML file. You know, XML has the little diamond braces and a bunch of markup that explains all the bits and pieces. And you can pretty much see what we did in the interface here. You can see, for example, this part right here says that we defi we're defining a string whose, name, whose ID is name, N-A-M-E. It has a label, say hello to. It has a description, this is who we say hello to, and a default value of world. So pretty much everything you saw in the builder, you're seeing here, except it's saved out now in this XML format. All right, so that's the XML file. Now, let's take a look at the main program. This is the main program that got generated by the Rapture Builder. And it has some gobbledygook that's all, in this case, all set up for Python. This is what you need to say in Python. In Python, you start out by importing the Rapture package. And you might want to bring in other things, too, like sys and math. Those are common libraries. And then it starts off with some stuff to open Rapture, rapture.library. And then it says io.get and io.get and all that. So this stuff, these statements are actually reaching inside that XML and getting the value of the thing called name. And this reaches inside the XML and gets the value of the Boolean, con the Boolean control uh, called exclaim. So now I have these two variables, name and exclaim, that represent my two inputs. That's what I'm trying to get out of the interface. And if I scroll down a little bit, you notice it says right here, add code here for the main body of your program. So I generate the skeleton. It's got, I've got a skeleton of a program now. I need to fill in the middle with the stuff that I want to do. And then at the very end, you can see that it's doing io.put, and it's saving that result variable. It's saving out the, the string called result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix up the middle part here. We'll just get rid of the progress stuff. And I'm going to add in some code here, um, basically. So the, the Hello World application, the whole point of it is to build a result string. And the result string is basically hello plus um, my name variable you know, hello world or hello Fred, right? So that's basically it. But I added a wrinkle to make it just a little more fun that if the exclaim um, is turned on, then I want to add on an exclamation point. Okay? So when exclaim is set, we'll add an exclamation point to the set, to the end. So that's the guts of my program. And you notice I'm using all those variables that I declared in the Rapture Builder. Um, my inputs are the variables name and exclaim, and my output is the variable result, which was automatically set up here to be saved as an output. So I'm, you know, those names we defined earlier are important. They become the variable names in your program. All right, so now I can save this, and now my program is all set to go. If I want to run it, I can just say Rapture. And Rapture, by default, if you say nothing else, We'll look for the tool.xml file in the current directory. We'll read the tool.xml, and we'll generate the whole interface. You notice it's got the title that we set for the application. It says simple Hello World app, and it says demo app for Bootcamp 2012. So that's the description stuff that we sent on the tool page. You notice that it's got uh, say hello to and the enthusiasm control here. And I really don't have to, with the way Rapture is normally set up, everything has good default values. I don't have to mess with it. I can just click the button. All your tools should be set. Like, most users don't know what to do, believe it or not, when confronted with a page like this. So the best thing is if they can at least click the button and it works, then you're in good shape. So we click the button. It went off and it ran my Python program. And it gave me back the result, hello world. Now let me try it again. I can try something else. I can give it uh, a different name, like Fred. And I can turn on the enthusiasm. And I can run it again. And now it generates hello Fred with an exclamation point. And the way Rapture is built, you can run lots of cases like this, and you can actually um, flip back and forth between the results. So we can try lots of different things. Uh, so now we have three different results. The original Hello World, the Hello Fred 
with enthusiasm, and Hello Boot Camp. So I've got all those different results that I can browse in the Rapture interface. It's actually a lot, it's a lot cooler when you have graphs and stuff, because then you can actually flip back and forth between the graphs instead of just messages. All right, and if I want to make changes, I can go back into the builder, Rapture-Builder, and I can load up, I can open that existing tool.xml file, and everything's right back where I left it, so I can make changes to name and exclaim and all of that. So maybe, maybe I want the default value to be true for the exclaim. I can do that, and I can save it. Now, when I go to save it again, I may just want to change the tool.xml file. If I regenerate the skeleton program at this point, it'll actually overwrite the changes that I made, right? So if I regenerate main.py, it'll basically wipe out the body that I had stuck in there, and that's no good. So if you do regenerate the skeleton program, you want to probably regenerate it in a different file. Otherwise, you're going to wipe out the work you did. Um, but in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to generate the skeleton. I'll just change the tool.xml, and I'll save it. And then now, if I run Rapture again, you notice now Enthusiasm is on by default, because that's what I did. I changed it. Right? So you can kind of go back and forth with the builder, make changes, test it. And when you get to a point like I am now, where everything is working properly, then your tool is ready to go on NanoHub. You can actually deploy it and put it out, and other people can use it. All right, so that was my demo, taking the two inputs and producing a string output. Um, oh, I showed it to you in Python. I got to show it to you in Fortran too, right? Huh? I, yeah, how many people use Fortran? How many people's grandfathers have used Fortran? A few? Nobody? Come on. I know your grandfathers use Fortran. Um, let me go back into the Rapture Builder, and I'll leave everything just as it was. Oh yeah, I gotta open my file again. So everything is just as it was, except now I'm gonna go into the tool section, and I'm gonna change the language to Fortran. Click on it, okay. So now it's Fortran 77, and I'm gonna save it, and I'm gonna I'm going to save the tool.xml, I'm going to have it generate a main program for Fortran, main.f, and I'm also going to generate something called a make file. When you have Fortran, Fortran's an old, old man's language, you have to compile it down to machine code so that you can run it, right? And when you want to compile it, there's a certain thing called a make file that makes it easy to compile. And in fact, Rapture makes it even easier because it generates the make file for you. So if you just click on that button, I'll get a make file where I can use to build Fortran. So I'm going to build all three. I'm going to get the tool definition, the skeleton program, and the make file, and click Save. Now if I take a look, you can see there's a make file there. Uh, whoops, right there. The make file shows these are the rules that I would use to build Rapture and, and uh, to build my program main.f. So it's showing all of that. And uh, I also have the program main.f that I need to fix up too. And again, this is the skeleton that Rapture generates, gets you most of the way there. It does the Fortran way of managing Rapture. It defines some stuff that Rapture needs, and it um, some variables at the top, and it does some stuff to kind of open up. You notice it's doing roughly the same thing. It's still trying to get the variable called name, and it's producing something called name, and it's still trying to get the, the Boolean value for exclaim, and it's setting that variable to exclaim as well. It has to do a little bit more stuff. There's still a middle part in here where you need to add your code, and then there's a part at the end where it's saving the string result. And so pretty much the same as Python, just a little different language in terms of how it works. Again, the recipe is I'm going to get rid of the stuff in the middle, and I'm going to put in my own stuff uh, in here. So I'm going to add um, if statement, if exclaim, uh, then result is hello uh, concatenated with the name, concatenated with the exclamation point. Otherwise, uh, just take hello and concatenate it with the name. Okay. So that's it. I just added in that little bit of code to kind of produce the string that I want, result. 
And um, now I have to compile it. So I type make. And what make does, oops, uh, just gives me a couple of warnings for unused variables. Ah, I'll clean them up. I don't like having warnings there. So back into my program, I've got the variable OK and RP units convert double that weren't really being used. OK. When you say make, it invokes the compiler rule with all the right libraries to build everything and link it all together. And at the end of that now, I have an executable program. And the executable program would be called main F77. Um, and if I look, sure enough, there's a program there, main F77. So that's the actual executable that Rapture is going to run when you're doing your simulation. And I'll type Rapture. And it looks like the same program. It's the same interface, world and exclaim and enthusiasm and all that. When I click simulate, it goes off and it runs the Fortran version now. And it builds that result. You probably wouldn't believe me unless, uh, unless I proved it to you. But we can take main.f and uh, change it to, uh, instead of hello, I'll just make it F77. And then I'll remake. Whenever you change your program in Fortran, you always have to rebuild, remake it, and then run Rapture. See? It says F77 world, which makes no sense. But at least you know it's the Fortran program that it's running now under the hood. So that's how it works. And again, the tool.xml is something that you, you figure out once. And it doesn't matter what language you're using. In the builder, you can choose whatever language you want. And then you build a skeleton program, and then you go from there to kind of connect it up to the guts of whatever you're trying to do. Uh, we have some programs on NanoHub that aren't even one thing. It'll be Rapture calls the Python program, the Python program execs the Fortran program, and MATLAB, and half a dozen other things, takes all the results, puts them together, and produces the final result. So you, know, you can build really complicated systems if you want to with all of this, but it all works pretty much that way. All right, so now. That was my demo, build the simple interface and show you two different programs, Python and Fortran. So now I want you guys to try it. Uh, I want you to get into a workspace now. You should be everybody authorized for workspace, all right. So you should be good to go, being able to get into NanoHub or Hub Zero into a workspace. And um, what I want you to do is build a program Whatever your favorite program or language is, whether it's Python or C or Fortran, whatever you feel comfortable with, Perl, Tickle, I don't care. Um, but pick a language that you're comfortable with, and I want you to build a program that has two integers uh, coming in, and you can sum them and produce an integer result, right? So for example, you could have you know, 2 plus 2, and you get the answer 4, right? Because 2 plus 2 is 4. Um, so your program, when you're running it, should look like this, should have two integers on the input side, and when you click the button, you're going to get a number result, an integer result on the output side. When, don't be surprised, when Rapture shows you an integer value, it'll show it to you like this on a graph, which is kind of weird. You might think it would just print out the value, like 4, um, but it's actually more useful to see it on a graph, because again, you can simulate again and again and again. You can stack up a bunch of results, and you can see them all on the same plot. So. Um, so it's kind of more useful to have it on a plot. But this is what the final program will look like. It's two integers on this side and an integer on this side, which shows up as a plot when you're running it. So if you do everything correctly, that's what you'll see. Now, when you're getting into workspaces, how many of you guys have used Linux before? You're like Linux gurus? Good. Uh, for you, those of you who have never seen Linux before uh, or a command line prompt, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll help you out. Uh, Derek here has got um, some sheets that he's going to pass around, uh, the work, workspace reference. And let me also show you, we have all the materials for this on the, on, uh, the website too. If you, uh, if you can't remember anything else and you're trying to figure out like, where do I go for documentation, if you can just remember Rapture with two Ps, Rapture.org with two Ps. It will take you to the Rapture website with all the documentation. And if you search on there for boot camp, you have to spell it right, um, you'll find, see boot camp 2012, right? 
That's us, Boot Camp 2012. And on this page, on rapture.org and on Bootcamp 2012, you'll see the outline and you'll see all the materials and you'll also see this workspace reference that uh, Derek has here, he's passing out. So the workspace reference will kind of help you get started, you know, logging into a workspace, how you launch it and all of that, and it gives you kind of a cheat sheet of various things that you want to do. What I'm going to suggest for each lab assignment, start with a fresh directory. So for this first lab assignment, use the makedir command, M-K-D-I-R, right? Makedir assignment one, whatever, lab one, whatever you want to call it. Make yourself a fresh directory. And then you can use the CD command, change directory. So you makedir lab one and then CD into lab one and then launch the builder and go from there. Each lab assignment, you're going to want to have a separate directory. Otherwise, when you start the next lab assignment, it's going to overwrite the tool.xml from the first lab assignment, and everything's going to get all balled up, right? So go ahead and log into a workspace, the way it shows on the left-hand side here. And from there, use some of these commands like make dir and cd. Make yourself a lab1 directory, change into that directory, and then you can go ahead and launch the Rapture Builder. And if you're like, dang it, I wish I was listening when he was telling me all that stuff about the Builder, if you're thinking that, don't panic because you can just go back onto Boot Camp and you can find right there all the slides that we just looked at, right? So remember, rapture.org, rapture with two Ps.org, go on to that, search for Boot Camp 2012, and on the Boot Camp 2012, by the way, there's earlier boot camps, 2011, 20, 29, don't, don't uh, get confused because the older uh, labs or the older uh, boot camps are not so good. They're not so up to date. So look for Boot Camp 2012, the fresh stuff. And there's the, all the slides for introducing Rapture um, right there. So you can pull up the PDF and use that as your cheat sheet. And also the, the uh, sheet that Derek um, passed around. And if you have any questions, we're going to spend like the next half an hour working our way through the lab assignment. I'll put it back up on the screen here. And um, if you have any questions, I want you to work through it and call people over, right? We got George here, we got Ben, we got Derek, and I'll be walking around too. We're all happy to help you guys with questions. So give it a try and see what you can come up with. All right, Let's, uh, let me show you what my solution is uh, for this particular lab assignment. So you remember, we're trying to build this program that takes two integer values and produces an integer result. And it's, it's real important that we use integers so that Rapture can kind of enforce the interface. So here I am over on my workspace on Hub Zero. I'll go into Boot Camp 2012. Um, I have all these directories on, that I use like file folders to keep everything separate. So you can see I got a lot of stuff here on hubzero.org. I'm working on a lot of different projects. And the easiest way to keep things straight is to, to make directories. So I've got this directory, and you notice I'm such a lazy typer. I can just type BO and hit tab, and it'll type everything else for me. Hey, that's pretty handy. So it types as much as it can, and then it waits for me to finish the rest. Is it 20, 2009, 2011, 2012? So I can go into Boot Camp 2012 and look around, and I've got these three assignments, lectures, and solutions folders. So I'll go into Solutions, and again, I type SO tab, and it fills in the rest for me. And I can look around, and then I can go into Exercise 1. If I wanted to, I could make a new directory. Um, I've got three solutions here, one for C language, one for Fortran, and one for Python. Um, but let's say I'll, I'll just make a new solution directory, new. So I say make dir new, and now I can CD to new, and now I have a nice fresh clean directory where I can keep all my stuff. Because you remember, when you run the builder, it's going to generate a tool.xml and a make file and a main program and all that stuff. And you don't want that to get lost with everything else you're doing. So make yourself a clean directory. Then I run rapture-builder to bring up the builder. And out of all these different controls, I try to pick the most specific one. Um, you know, you could grab, for example, a string over here and use a string as an input value. But that means that anybody could type in whatever string they want. They don't have to use integers. They could type in XYZ or hello world. And when you get into MATLAB or C and you're trying to add hello to world as numbers, it's not going to work, right? You're going to get trouble. So 
forget about the string, because that'll mess you up. When you got a control you don't want, there's a little delete button here over to the side. I can click delete, and that goes away. So instead, I'm going to grab an integer. And I'll put that over here. You notice there's also a number in Rapture. The number in Rapture lets you have fractional values. So if you wanted to have a number like 2.17 or 3.14159, you can use a number for that. Number also has physical systems of units, and we'll be learning more about it as we go along. So you have to ask yourself, in this case, am I supposed to use, a, can I allow num number values with fractional values, double values, with units, or is it an integer? The assignment here was integer, so I'm going to stick with integers, but there's a subtle difference. If you're trying to have a, a number of grid points, for example, you can't have 2.7 grid points, right? That has to be an integer, like 100 grid points or 1,000 grid points. You can't have, you know, fractional values. So. Think about the controls as you're dragging them over. Make sure you got the right ones. Again, I could always produce string output, but I don't want a string output. I want an integer output so I can plot it. So, uh, so I've got two integers coming in, and I'm going to rename the first one n1, and I'll prompt the user um, by saying add this, and give it a default value. You should always give a default value. In fact, if I don't, when I go to save this or do something, preview it, Rapture is going to yell at me and tell me there's errors and warnings I have to fix up. So I'm going to give it a default value, whatever you think makes sense. I'll say zero. And then the other one, I'm going to rename it to n2. That'll give it a nice variable name in my program, n2. And I'll label it um, to this. And I'll give it also a default value of zero. And then finally, on the output side, I'm going to rename that to sum. And this is, uh, I'll call it sum. Um, sum of the two inputs. All right. So now I can try to preview and see what I'm going to get. Uh-oh, five warnings for the current tool definition. Do I want to take a look? Yeah, I might as well take a look. Um, again, it's telling me I should have a title. I'll call it lab, oops, number one. Number one, all right. And then um, next, and it'll tell me a description, solution, or lab number one. And next, and it'll tell me I need to choose my program. OK. Um, so a lot of you guys, I noticed, were using MATLAB. Um, that's good, because it's easy and you may know it already. I'm going to choose, um, you could choose MATLAB. I'm going to choose Octave, and I'll tell you why. It's the same as MATLAB, like 99% the same. It's the same language, the same everything. It doesn't quite have as fancy a GUI, but it also doesn't take as long for the whole program to start up. When MATLAB starts up, man, it takes a long time for that GUI to come up. And that's nice when you're sitting there working with it interactively, but it's not so nice when you have a program that you're trying to run and debug, as some of you found out. Um, so you may not be able to tell the difference between Octave and MATLAB as far as Rapture is concerned because it's just it's running your script under the hood and it's just the same programming language, basically. Um, plus, if you like free software, go GNU free software. Then you, you might as well use Octave and support them. Um, so anyway, and because it's not licensed software, you'll actually find it on a lot more places. When, when we deal with MATLAB, we have to be careful. We have to make sure Purdue people are using MATLAB and NanoHub and all this stuff, which is why we ran into the permission problems with some of you guys, which we sort of worked around for now, but there's a better fix. Um, so the, with, with MATLAB, there's all these headaches that deal with commercial software and all of that. Um, all the other hubs, uh, you'll find Octave. It's a standard thing. It's in Linux. It's on all the other hubs. So when you run into a roadblock with MATLAB, just switch to Octave, because chances are you won't notice the difference. The syntax is all pretty much the same, unless you're using the toolboxes and stuff. All right, let me keep working through my, get down off my soapbox and keep working through my, my notes. Um, it's asking me for a description and another description, and that's pretty much it. So I didn't bother with those two descriptions. If I try to preview now, it still says there are two warnings, but I'll just say, don't look at those problems. Um, go on ahead. So. If the warnings are benign or you don't want to fix them or whatever, Rapture will keep nagging you about it. But don't worry, just move on. Um, the, um, so now I've got an interface where there are two integers coming in, default value 0, and it'll produce an output integer, which is the sum. Um, all right. So uh, I can save all this. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. 
and still nagging me about all those warnings. I really should fix them. Um, I'm going to choose a tool definition file uh, in this directory, tool.xml, and I'll have it generate the skeleton program, and there's no need for a make file with Octave. Um, so I'll just have it generate that, save it, and quit now. So now you can see my two files there. My tool.xml has all the XML code in it with the integers and all that. And my this is my main program generated by the Rapture Builder. And you can see that it's basically pulling out the variable uh, n1 here and the variable n2. And then at the very bottom of the program, it's saving out the variable sum right here, converting it to a number and then a number to a string, basically, and then saving it back out. So what I, my job is to fix up where it says, add your code here, right? That's your marker. That's where your code goes. If your program runs for a long time, you can put out all these util, uh, progress messages. You can say, you know, my program's starting. Don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. 10% done. Hang on, hang on. 20% done. So if your program takes a long time to run, it's a good idea to put out these progress messages so the user isn't like, why is it hung up, you know? So you can say what's happening in your program. In this case, the program runs so quickly, it's not even worth putting out the progress messages, so I'll get rid of them. And what I say instead is um, sum equals n1 plus n2. So that's what I wanted to do, basically. You know, 2 plus 2 is 4, and then write out the sum. So that's the whole body of this particular program. You notice this all looks like MATLAB syntax, right? I mean, if you know MATLAB, this is basically the same stuff. All the stuff you can do in MATLAB, you can do here in Octave. It's a clone of MATLAB. All right, so I save that out, and now I can run Rapture. And it'll prompt me now, uh, oops, for the two values. So I can plug in 2 plus 2 and simulate. Oh, and it's given me a hard time. Um, it's given me a hard time. Sometimes it gives you a hard time because you haven't got the right use thing. So if I say, it, uh, you have to make sure, what? Yeah, but I do. Um, so you have to make sure that you're using the right program, right? Um, a lot of you guys ran into this because you got right to where I did, and it was like, dang it, it doesn't work. Uh, and in the next section, I'm going to show you how it all works under the hood and how to debug all of that. But one of the first things that you can run into is the fact that Octave may not be working. So you got to make sure you've got the use thing set up. If it is set up, you should see a star there. So I've got Octave set up, and if there's any doubt, you can, you can say use again and make it persistent. Um, let me see. Beyond that, I must have some kind of syntax error in what I did. On Octave? Hmm. So you say, you say just int? What are you saying? Uh, into a double, right? We'll try Derek's solution. We'll see if Derek got it. Two plus two. Four. Hooray! So int32 used to work in older versions of Octave in order to convert to an integer. But So the skeleton must be generating something a little funny or something. Yeah, check on that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about debugging in the next section. I didn't want to get too far into the debugging stuff because we're going to do that to death in the next section. Um, let me show you quickly one more solution because some of you guys did uh, C language. So again, I can do rapture-builder and I can open my tool.xml and uh, again, preview it. Um, same interface, but this time under the tool section, I'm going to choose something else. I'm going to choose C language as my target language. And when I go to save it, uh, I've got a tool.xml, and I can have it generate a skeleton program and a make file. Make sure you do the make file. I saw some people generating the skeleton program, but just trying to compile it by hand. It's too hard to compile it by hand, because you've got to get all the right libraries and the include files and everything. So when you're dealing with something where there's an option to generate a make file, make sure you generate the make file. That's very handy. Um, so again, I'm going to save this now, and I can get in and edit my program. So here's the, the program that it generated for me in C. 
And again, you can see it grabbing the value for N1 and the value for N2 and producing the sum. So again, I'm going to say sum equals N1 plus N2. That's basically the body of my program in C language. And I'll save that out. And now that's not enough. I have to actually uh, make it. Um, I generated this nice make file that explains how to build my program. And now that I've got it, I can just say make. Um, it's giving me a warning about an unused variable. I can go in and clean that up. Line 18, I think it said error. So it didn't like that. That wasn't used. So I can say make. Now it builds cleanly. And you notice there's all the libraries and everything. At the end of that, there's a program there. It's called, the program it builds is called main C. And so we're ready to run. Now I can run Rapture and give it a value like 3 and 5 and simulate. And it gives me the sum 8. You notice if I give it different values, like 3 and 7, then it'll give me 10. And if I give it 3 and 12, it'll give me 15. And I can go back through all of the different values. And I can also click on the All button to kind of plot them all at once. Um, so when you simulate a bunch of cases in Rapture, you can actually get a bunch of plots. This, this feature is actually more handy, not when you're dealing with something like 2 plus 2 equals 4, but imagine that you're simulating something as a function of temperature, and you want to try a bunch of different temperatures, and at each temperature you get a number, and then by trying a bunch of temperatures, you can plot them all, you can actually sort of build a curve of how it varies versus temperature, or how it varies versus pressure, all the different things that you can change. So, um, so this is kind of a handy uh, feature, this plotting thing, and that's the reason it's set up that way. You notice also, because I used an integer value here, if I try to type in x, y, z, it gives me an error. So Rapture does all this built-in error checking. If you try to type something funny, then it's going to give you an error. I, even if I try to type 2.214724, whatever, it gives me a problem with it. Um, so, so if you... Uh, and the integer control also has little buttons built in, so you can just click the buttons to change the value, um, which is another little feature. So if you use the right control you know, for the type that you're trying to, to deal with, it'll give you a better version. It'll, it'll do all the error checking properly. It'll give you built-in things like the little buttons. Um, so you should always be the most specific you can with all the Rapture controls and, and uh, what you're intending to do.